We're in Matthew and we're in chapter number 11. And I want to read to you a passage of Scripture uh, starting in verse number 20. Uh, the background of this is that John the Baptist has now been been uh, taken, in, he's been arrested, and later on, we're going to find that his head will be chopped off, uh, but John is in, uh, in prison, and he sends his disciples to Jesus and say, are you the one? Are you the one? Uh, and it's almost a, a, a question just to be certain who Christ was, and there's this kind of a doubting that's going on, and then we have... Um, Verse number 20, where Jesus is now not going to speak to those that kind of doubt, but now he's going to speak to those that reject Christ. Uh, and listen to what he says to those cities. Verse 20, then Jesus began to denounce the cities in which most of his miracles had been performed because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethesda. If the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted up to the skies? No, you will go down to the depths. If the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Sodom, it would, have, it would have remained to this day. But I tell you that it will be more bearable for Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. Let me stop right there before we go on. I really want to focus in on the last three verses of our reading. But here we have Christ speaking uh, to those cities that he did many, many of his miracles in, specifically Capernaum. It was one of those cities that got to see Christ doing many, many of his miracles. And here Jesus looks at them and says, are you kidding me? You have been given so much knowledge. You have been given so many signs by the miracles that I have done, but still you refuse to repent. Still you, you refuse to believe. You know, it is so bad that if just these miracles were done in that place that is well known called Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, Sidon and, and, and Tyre, uh, they would have repented. So you think you've got it all together? But why are you so hard in your heart that you will not turn? And so he pronounces judgment upon them. And he says, listen, there is definitely going to be a judgment. And that's what he refers to on the day of the judgment. It's going to be more bearable for Sodom than it would be for Capernaum. And so he really states for us this reality that there is going to come a day of judgment uh, when all will be judged. Uh, there's going to come a day when those who have not repented, they have not turned to Christ, they have not trusted Jesus Christ uh, for the uh, pardon of their sins as Christ was punished on the cross for our sin. Uh, those ones who reject Christ, they will be punished in hell. The day of judgment. And now he's going to go on in this passage and, and now sharing to these people, you come to me at verse number 25. And so at that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you've hidden these things from the wise and the learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this was your good pleasure. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father. No one knows the Father except the Son. And those to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. So now he's saying, uh, I'm revealing myself to you. And uh, God is calling you to me. And now he says this, verse 28. And this is where I want to spend our time. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I want to focus in on this passage, and I really want to uh, apply it in two different ways this morning. Firstly, a call to the non-believer one that has not trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, 
to come to him, your potatoes and that burden, and you've gotten on the truck and you still got it on your shoulders, and our Lord says, come to me, and if you're burdened and, and heavy laden, and, and I, I'm going to give you rest. So go with this passage, through this passage with me. Verse 28 um, says this, come to me. This word coming to him uh, really implies something, and it implies this, to come to him, you come from something. And so it, it, it gives us this thought that to come to Christ, we have to leave something. To come to him, we leave something. Uh, for the one who's not trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, to come to him means to, to leave the, the, the world of sin, to do what Peter spoke about in, in the book of Acts, chapter number 2, when he said to repent and turn to Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, to turn from that and come to Christ. It is this idea of you were living in this way now. Turn, leave that, come to me. Leave behind everything, come to me. And this is the same picture that Jesus drew for us uh, when, he, uh, when, when he invited a man to follow him. And the man said, oh, let me rather go and, and bury my father. Then I will come. And Jesus said, no, let the dead bury their, their dead. You follow me. And so there are things that hold us back from coming uh, to Christ. Could it be that you're being held back this morning by pride? I can do this. Uh, maybe you're being held back by a habitual sin and you love your sin more than what you love God and hence you're not willing to leave that and to come to Christ. What is it that's holding you back from coming to Jesus? Believer, well, what is holding you back from, from coming to him and, and just laying it at his feet? Uh, is it maybe for some of you the guilt of the past? And, and you look at your past and you say, you know what, I, I, I just cannot get over the past. Maybe it's bitterness in your life and you're angry and, and, and you don't want to let that go and you're not going to forgive and, and you're not finding rest. You are restless within you. And it's time maybe to lay down that bitterness and that unforgiveness. Maybe it's time to lay down that lifestyle that God may look at and say, but that's not pleasing to me. What is it that holds you back from coming? You see, coming implies leaving. But notice what he said when he said come. He said, come to me. Come to me. Boy, as I was studying this passage and, and spending time with the Lord, uh, more specifically last night that this stood out to me was it did not say come to church. Uh, it did not say come to some religious organization. It did not say come to, uh, come to a club or, or, or anything like that. But Jesus' invitation is of a very personal nature. He says, you come to me. Come to me. You see, we're not called to come to a set of rules. We're not called to come to play a religious game and to show our faces on a Sunday and dress as, as everybody else dresses and put on the little mask that everybody wears. And when everyone says, how are you doing? We say, I'm fine. In the inside, we're dying. God's not calling us to come and play games, to come and be religious, to come and keep a bunch of rules. What he's saying is you come to me. It is a call for relationship. Can you begin to imagine this, that the God Almighty, the creator of the heavens and the earth, wants to have a personal relationship with you. And we know that that relationship is only made possible because of what Jesus did on the cross. That Christ died. That his blood was shed so that we should no longer be at enmity with him, but that we may be at peace with him. Can you begin to imagine that that God who's absolutely independent, he, used, he needs absolutely nothing, wants to have a personal relationship with you? Not because you're pretty. In fact, it's because you are sin sick. What Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2, that we are dead in our transgressions. Now, I know when we choose people for relationships, 
many times we choose those that are welcoming to the eye. I know the first thing that drew me to my wife is her pretty looks. I'll never forget in, in, in the 10th grade, no, I'm lying in the 11th grade, something like that. Uh, it was when we first met. And I saw this pretty little thing on her ice skate, skating in the ice rink. I was not drawn by her personality. I was not drawn by um, her wealth. I was drawn by she looked pleasing to me. You see, but that's the way our relationships are, aren't they? We are drawn by what someone else can give us or do for us. But not God. God is independent. He doesn't need anything. But because of his wonderful grace, undeserved merit, he now looks at you and me and he says, come to me. I want to have a relationship with you. I don't want you to have a relationship with this world. I want you to have a relationship with me. You know, I, my mind goes to what Jeremiah said about the importance of, of knowing him. In the book of Jeremiah, chapter number nine, I want to read this to you. In Jeremiah chapter nine, verse number 23 and 24, this is what Jeremiah uh, says, well, as the Lord speaks uh, through Jeremiah. Say, this is what the Lord declares. Let not the wise man boast of his wisdom or the strong man boast of his strength or the rich man boast of his riches but let him who boasts boast about this that he understands and knows me that I am the Lord who exercises kindness justice and righteousness on the earth for in these I delight. Let the man who boasts boast about this, that he understands and knows me. Let him boast about the fact that he has a relationship with me. And this is what John prayed when John prayed in his high priestly prayer in John chapter 17, verses 2 and 3, when he said, For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to those you have given him. Now, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. You see, a relational knowledge is what's being called for here. That he's saying, you come not to keep a set of rules or to be part of a club. You come to me. You come to me on the basis of what I've done on the cross. Because God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Jesus died for us. The way has been paved through the blood of Christ. And he says, you just come. You come to me. Whom is he calling all you who are weary and burdened. Notice that word all. Don't, don't skip over it. Come to me all. Come to me all. Do you think that includes you and me? I think it does. And he says, you come. Uh, this is a, a call for everyone. You come. But, but God still allows us to make that decision. You come. All who are weary and burdened weary you'll get very weary if you're trying to save yourself do you know that on that day of judgment that he had just spoken about about Chorazin, Sidon, Tyre uh, when he spoke about Sodom he spoke about um, Capernaum do you know that on that day of judgment it's not going to be a judgment of good versus bad do you know that uh, if you got in your mind the picture of, of, of justice, what is she blindfolded and she's got a sword and she has the, the scales, there's going to be no scale in heaven weighing up your good and your bad. Because according to the Bible, it says that your good works, our good works is nothing but filthy rags in the eyes of God. 
The only thing that can outweigh our sin is the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we've trusted him. Friend, if you are working yourself to death, you find yourself weary, trying to find salvation, trying to do enough good to outweigh the bad, trying your best to find some kind of peace, I want to encourage you today, come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. There is salvation found in no other name but in the name of Jesus Christ. That you would come to Christ and not push and try to, with your own will and your own energy, your own power to try and gain salvation. It is impossible. Those who are weary. Maybe you're a believer and you're weary this morning. Been working so hard. got so many things you're trying to do. Is today the day that you just come to him and say, Lord, I, I, I want a relationship with you, that you live your life through me, not by my power or my might, but by your spirit. I just want to relax in you. When I, I hear of this, come to me, your weary burden, I'm going to give you rest. This is the picture that goes in my mind and it's the idea of running uh, to uh, what I see a lot happening up front here with little kids about this size that run and jump onto their parents' lap. And every now and then, when you're lucky, <laughs> one of them falls asleep in the service <laughs> in their parents' arms at peace. Just a great safe place to find themselves. Is this what Jesus is calling us to? non-believer, he says, come. Uh, don't weary yourself trying to, to seek after salvation. Salvation's been held out to you. For God sent his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish. For God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. Believer, you're saved by grace, but you've also been kept by the grace of God. Did you get that? You're saved by grace, but you're also kept by the grace of God. There are so many believers today that, are, that, that believe, well, I've been saved by grace, but boy, I really have to work to keep it. No, you don't. No, you don't. No, no, don't weary yourself trying to keep your salvation. Just allow God to live his life through you. Just live in that relationship with him. God's at work. You just be obedient to him. He says, come to me, you who are weary. But then the next word he says, and are burdened. Burdened. Now, this is the idea of carrying those potatoes, that, that crystal. Boy, I'm glad she did that this morning. There was no corroboration here this morning. That's good. That is that, that idea of putting down a weight. But firstly, non-believer, you have a weight on your shoulders. And that weight is a sin weight. It's a sin weight, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the wage of that sin is death. You're walking around right now with a sentence above your head. And that sin is weighing you down. You cannot be all that God wants you to be because you have, you're lost. You're living for yourself. But Christ can remove that burden. And he did that on the cross. Believer, maybe you too carry a sin burden. I'm not saying a burden that will take you to hell. We know that Christ has saved you. I'm saying maybe you've got a burden that you've allowed Satan a foothold in your life. And you're burdened. And you can't find rest. And, and, and you've got the sense of dread. You've got the sense of it's just not like it should be. You're right, it's not like it should be. You see, that's what happens when we believers allow for sin to get into our lives. We understand that the cross, we were saved, uh, we're justified. The sin has no more power over us. The penalty is paid. But friends, we do live with the presence of sin today. We have the flesh. We live in a, a sinful world. We know that there's Satan who's attacking. We know that. But it does not mean that we have to live lives that are defeated 
We live lives that are victorious in Christ Jesus. In fact, Paul told us in the book of Romans chapter 8 that, that we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. We don't have to live lives burdened down by the sin of the world. We just have to live in the freedom of Christ. Maybe you're burdened by the sin that I have found many of us, specifically even me, guilty of, and that is the, the sin of the fear of man, burdened by the expectations of everybody else. In the, in the book of Proverbs, it says that the fear of man will prove to be a snare, but those who trust in the Lord will be kept safe. You see, that's many times that burden that holds us back is those expectations of other people that are placed upon us. You see, the only expectation that we should be living for is before the expectations of Christ. This is the idea of living before the audience of one. It doesn't mean that we do not have an accountability within the body of Christ, but I'm saying we do not have to live up to the expectations of everybody else, but only the expectation of Christ. So Christ says, come to me, all you are weary and burdened. And notice what he then does. And I will give you rest. I will give you rest. The Greek word anapeo is used here, and it means to I will revive you. I will give you refreshment. It, it, it is the idea of refreshment from the labor of a long journey. I don't know if any of you have been on a long journey. Uh, I, I remember flying here from, the United, from South Africa to the United States. Our first time we ever came, uh, we were in transit for 56 hours. And uh, I, I'll never forget when we arrived here that we lay down on the bed and... It was lights out, lights out. Woke up the next morning. It was in a December, coming from Africa to a December in the United States of winter, freezing cold. And we walked outside and that ice cold wind was so refreshing. Refreshing. Come to me and I will give you rest. The dictionary speaks of rest in different ways. One way it speaks of is the cessation from action. The cessation from action. Boy, I'm so thankful that when you come to Christ, it is the cessation of action. We don't have to try to gain our, our salvation, that we know that it comes from Him, that Christ has given it. He now acts through us. It also speaks of rest as the freedom from worries. When you read the Webster's Dictionary, rest the freedom from worries. Maybe that's why Jesus would teach in Matthew 6 that do not worry because your Father knows everything you need. You can rest. This is the idea of you don't have to walk wringing your hands worried about everything, but that you can rest. Rest in knowing that our God is taking care of it. You don't have to worry. It also uses the word rest in the sense of something that is fixed or settled. Something that is fixed or settled, something that's at rest is fixed and settled. When you come to Christ, friend, you can know something for certain, that your salvation is settled, fixed. You don't have to worry about that. In fact, you, what you can stand upon is the knowledge that Christ is the author, and listen to this, the perfecter of our salvation. That which he begun, he will end. This is where Paul would pray and say, for I know whom I believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him until that day. Fixed and settled. At rest in Webster's Dictionary is also given as being confident and trustful. Confident and trustful. Come to me, you are weary and burdened, and I will give you confidence, and you can be trustful in me. And then lastly, 
It gives the idea of leaning or to repose or to depend upon something, to rest upon something. Then he goes on in this passage to say, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. Take my yoke upon you. I'm not as old as the majority in this room, but I believe when you all were growing up, they used to put uh, yokes on oxen. Is that correct? No one's nodding because they know they're going to date themselves. <laughs> Everyone knows what a yoke is, right? Not an egg yolk. That's the not so good piece of the egg. I'm talking about a yoke on an ox, and that's what he's speaking about here. A wooden thing uh, that the two oxen would put on, and they would walk and labor together. And you would never put a mule with an ox. Doesn't work. Uh, You'd never put a a horse uh, with an ox, but you would put two of the same in the same, and it would always be the stronger one, the one that's more experienced, the one that knows where to go and knows what, what is to be done. And this is what he's saying. Come into the yoke with me. Come, put this thing on with me. We're gonna work together. I want you to come alongside. Come with me. Put on my yoke. Follow me in my work. Labor alongside me. This yoke is, is, is a yoke of identifying with him. This is where we identify with him. Uh, that, that was spoken of in 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, uh, verses 17 through 20, uh, that, that, that speaks of the fact that we are in Christ and we are a new creation. The old's gone and the new has come. This is the idea that we are now his ambassadors. We are working with him on his mission. That is identifying with Christ. That's the yoke. Can I ask you this morning, with whom do you identify? If you're a non-believer, someone that has not trusted Jesus Christ, your identity is found in the world. But if you're a believer and you've trusted Christ, your identity is in him. He's removed your sin. He's made you into a new creation. Your identity now is Christ. Can I challenge you this morning in asking, when people look at you, what would they identify with you? I used to play this this game and then it got difficult. But I used to close my eyes and get others to close theirs, and I'd call out names, and I'd say things like uh, Tiger Woods, and they would shout out golf. (laughs) And I may call out um, uh, Jeff Gordon, and they would say NASCAR. You see, those names are related. They're identified with someone or something. Should I shout out your name this morning? What does the world say? Do they say Christ follower? What do people identify with you? That's a rather um, difficult question to answer sometimes. When we are being identified or we identified as those that are in the yoke with Christ, that yoke is also a yoke of discipleship discipleship. Look what he says. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Discipleship. This is where God is inviting us into that relationship with Christ and that we move in the same direction with him. This is what Jesus spoke of when he said, follow me, follow me. And, and here we have these disciples walking with Christ, and he's teaching them, and they're learning. Not only are they learning, but they're getting to do. Uh, it's discipleship. Uh, it is walking alongside. It's learning and growing. Could I ask you this morning, are you growing in Christ? Are we learning? I've been very blessed. I, I have one or two men that um, I have they meet with me on a weekly basis and, and we grow together. We, we have a discipleship book that we've been going through together and we're growing together. It's discipleship. I have men that disciple me. Could I ask you, are you a learner this morning? If you've come into the yoke with Christ, 
Are you working alongside him and identifying with him? But secondly, are you learning? Are you learning? Are you growing? Are you producing the fruit of discipleship? He says, take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Can I close with this thought? James sang a song this morning, I pledge allegiance to the Lamb. That is what Jesus is calling for in that passage. He's saying, come to me. Come have a relationship with me. Take on my yoke. Identify with me. Submit yourself to me. Learn from me. Take your direction from me. Walk with me. Labor with me. And I will give you rest. And you will find rest for your soul. Where does your allegiance lie this morning? Have you come to him to find the rest that comes from Christ only? Are you in the yoke or are you not? The thing I love about this yoke is that he's always strong when I'm weak. When I can't hold up my side, doesn't mean that I'm not in the yoke anymore. He's there alongside us. So I close with this thought. Where does your allegiance lie this morning? Have you come to him to find rest? Or are you working at it, trying your best to find some kind of a, a, a inner peace, an inner rest that you're not going to find outside of Jesus Christ? You see, there is a day of judgment that's gonna come and if you're not a believer and you've not come to Christ, there's no rest for your soul. Not today and never will there be. Because it's told to us in the scripture that that place where we will be sent after the judgment is the place where the worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. It's that place of complete unrestfulness. That is only rest found in Jesus. Have you come to Christ? And then believers, if you've come to Christ, why don't you just lay it down? Those areas in your life you're struggling in, those sins that you're struggling with. The Bible says that if we would, if we would confess our sin, that he is righteous and he's just and he will forgive us our sin and he will purify us from all unrighteousness. We are told that he wants to hold us in his hand and he wants to take care of our needs. He's the God that wants us to live in peace with him and with others. I tell you, it's very difficult to do that when you've got all this other stuff going on in your life. Is it time for you to say, Lord, I come afresh and you just to experience that amazing grace that comes from you? Let me pray with you, and I'm going to ask the praise team to come and close us um, in, in song. As they're coming, I'll pray. Lord, thank you. I want to thank you for the personal invitation that we received this morning to come and find rest from you. I pray for those in the service that have not come to Jesus as their Savior. And I pray for them, Lord, that, that you would draw them unto yourself, that they may call upon the name of Jesus Christ, that they may be saved. I pray for the believers in this room that are just struggling. The cares of this world, the struggles, sometimes even the sin that seems to become prevalent in our lives. Lord, we... We, we don't want that. We want to be holy as you are holy. We know your word says that we should train ourselves towards godliness and Lord, that's what we seek. But the reality is, Lord, without you, we're nothing. Without you, we cannot do anything. So we just thank you on this day for your amazing grace. And we thank you that 
It's all because of what you've done and what you're continuing to do in our lives that we're able to live in victory today. As we go to the river for baptism, Lord, I pray it would be a wonderful experience for each one here as we see a man going through the waters of baptism declaring, I pledge allegiance to the Lamb. Lord, I pray for David this morning as he's baptized that you would strengthen him, that you would give him the ability to live in victory for you, that he would be a great example to his wife and his children, that he would be the man that you've empowered him to be. So now we thank you for this time we've had in your word. Lord, we praise you for the wonderful privilege we have of worshiping you. That's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.